evening, everyone. Well, did everyone enjoy our last warm day of the year? <laughs> I hope you were able to get out and breathe some of that fresh air. Because ready or not, here comes winter. But we know God's faithful and God's with us. And let's stand together and sing his praises. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your watchful care through the week and that we can be gathered together again in your house to worship you. Uh, we lift up the needs of those who need a special touch from you today and we ask, dear God, that you receive our praise this day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to welcome everyone here today, whether you're here in person or watching us from home, we're glad you're here. Uh, there's a few announcements that I'd like to highlight this morning. Uh, this is the last day to sign up for the book club, which will be starting on November the 20th through December 18th at 6 p.m. It's an Advent journey uh, called Entering the Story, and there's a sign-up sheet out back on the table. Also, there's a Christian education meeting at 6 o'clock tomorrow night and a missions committee meeting following that at 7. Um, this is the last day to sign up for the bird, feeding, bird feeder activity that will be next week. And that also is on the table in Jewel Hall. Um, I just want to remind everybody that next Sunday, no, not next Sunday, yes, next Sunday, the 20th, there will be a society meeting at 11. Um, and that's also when the book club will start that night. And you've probably had a chance to look at the adorable little twins that have blessed the Hooker family. So congratulations, Nancy and Richard, on little Josie Leanne and Tate Patrick. <laughs> um, and at this time, if you're able, I'd like you to stand for the singing of our national anthem.
Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, we are going to honor our veterans. So if you're a veteran, would you please come forward? Just come on up here. I won't make you get up on the stage. It's a little too intimidating. I'll have you stand here by me. Yep. All right. So um, I would just like for you to introduce yourself and say where you served and what your rank was. Uh, I was an ET-4. Uh, I served with the Navy uh, back in the Vietnam era. Okay. And Gene Gutierrez. Very nice. Hi, I'm Paul Bullock, and uh, I got out as a sergeant from the United States Army Military Police Corps. You can hold it. I don't, no. I don't need to be in charge all the time. My name's Dennis Carmody. I was a Spec 4. I served in the Vietnam War. Very good. Mm -hmm. I'm Hank Gardner. I was in the reserves, and it was between wars, so I didn't have to go anywhere. But I was on a radar picket ship. And then when the satellites came up, they scrapped all 16 of the ships. <laughs> all right, and I'm sure there are some here that aren't, aren't with us today um, who are veterans. But we want to thank you for your service, and we have a little token of our appreciation. You might as well take two, because there's plenty. How's that sound? Yeah, that, that sounds good. OK. Yeah. I, I learned in the Army never to turn down cancer. <laughs> <laughs> My, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. We're going to have two. One? Yeah, take two. All right. Thank you so much for your service. And yes, we thank you for your service. And let's continue our worship in song. So stand if you're able. We have another song to sing. 10,000 Reasons.
Dear Lord, today we do thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. And as we're starting November, the, the, the Thanksgiving month, Lord, we do thank you for your many, many blessings. As the song says, 10,000 reasons for my heart to sing. Lord, we just thank you for the way that you bless us, for the, the friends, the family you bring around us, for the way that they touch us, for the encouragement, the hope that we find. And Lord, just for your strength and your mercies that are, like the scripture says, new every day. And Lord, I do thank you. In that second verse, it says, and on that day when my strength is failing, we know that at that time, we can still, we can go to you. And Lord, we take that as a promise for those, our loved ones, who have already passed over, and that we will be able to see them again. And Lord, I thank you for that. It is a wonderful promise that you have given us. And Lord, for all that you do, for your many blessings, just each and every day, we do want to praise you today and just lift you up and celebrate your love and your goodness to us. We ask this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to read the scripture and then we have another song that we'll be singing. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9. Verses 3, 5, and 6. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. Stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. And I know we've been doing a lot of up and down this morning. <laughs> but if you want to stand one more time, you can for this song. Or if you want to stay seated, that's okay too.
as the ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings. And at this time, we'd like Alma to come and share a special with us. No, but I didn't practice, but this is an old song that I learned to play when I was young, and I love it, and I haven't played it here in a little bit, so I'm going to play it today, and the, so the name of the song is In the Garden. I didn't practice either. <laughs> I didn't know we were doing
that ministry. Now, previously in the book of Acts, uh, last week we were talking in Acts chapter 4, where Peter and John had healed the, the beggar, the crippled beggar who laid outside the temple, um, asking people as they went in if they would give to him. And Peter and John healed him. And then it's, the scripture tells us that the man went with them into the temple. I believe this was the first time he was able to go into the temple with them. And he was walking and he was jumping and he was praising God. And that uh, brought a lot of attention. And when Peter saw the group of people around, he started to preach, telling them how Jesus had given the healing. And the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish leaders, they were not thrilled with anyone speaking about Jesus. They didn't want anybody preaching about Jesus. But what really ticked him off was a lot of people were listening. And that they really did not want to have happen. So they wanted to shut up Peter and John. And so they arrested them. And then the next morning, they brought them out on trial. And I, I, fair warning, um, if you're following closely in the scripture, I am changing the chronology slightly of a few of the comments made in or around the trial. I don't think I'm changing the spirit of it at all, but just a, a little bit of the placement. But they wanted to shut Peter and John up. And they thought maybe they could deny that any miracle had happened, you know? It just didn't happen. Fake news, whatever it was. But they said, but since they could see the man that had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. But they decided to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people. So they warned Peter and John to speak no longer to anyone in Jesus' name. Now, there was nothing like freedom of speech in their constitution. So if the judges told you to quit talking about that, you were supposed to quit talking about that. And if you didn't, there would be severe repercussions. So conventional wisdom had that Peter and John should keep their mouth shut. They did not follow conventional wisdom. Instead, right in the Sanhedrin, right, right in the judges' faces, they said, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. It, it just, totally off topic. You think they kind of made it obvious who was on God's side here? You know, these religious leaders, and they're saying, should we obey you or God? Because you're not on the same page. Um, and so, should is it in... <laughs> judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now, there could be a whole sermon right there, that these unschooled, ordinary men were doing extraordinary things, and they realized that it is because they had been with Jesus. If we've been with Jesus, it's supposed to show in the way that we live. They wanted, but they, they wanted to... Shut them up. But then we're told that the Sanhedrin could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. So after a beating and further threats, they let them go. Now Peter and John had to know that they had just dodged a bullet. They had just stood before the Sanhedrin, defied them to their face, and then been let go with only a beating and threats. And that was light. They had to realize that. They had to know that standing against the Sanhedrin was a very dangerous place to be. We looked just a couple chapters ahead. Stephen did the same thing. Stephen also got the Sanhedrin very upset. And what happened to him? They executed him on the spot. Peter and John knew it would have been very easy for the same thing to happen to them. And they knew that without God's protection, they would be gone. And all they had to do, all they had to do was to stay out of trouble was keep their mouths shut. That's all they had to do. They wouldn't do it. So the Sanhedrin lets them go. And they go back to the church leaders and they start conferring with the other church leaders and they told them all about, you know, we were arrested and they beat us and, and then they threatened us and 
bad things are going to happen to us, probably, if we keep preaching in Jesus' name. What should we do? And conventional wisdom, again, would have been, get out of town. You know, I mean, if nothing, they even had, it's not biblical basis for this because they hadn't written the, the New Testament yet, but they even had the example of Jesus here. Because remember when Jesus, a couple times, when he was under threat from the uh, Jewish the J- leaders in Jerusalem, he moved up to Galilee for a while to get away from the immediate pressure. So they could have easily said, well, you know, let's go up to Galilee. That's what Jesus did. But the Spirit was leading them to stay. And so in consultation with the other leaders of the church, they decided they were going to stay. And then they prayed. They said, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and to perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. And I'm impressed by that. All they had to do to be out of trouble was shut up. That's all they had to do. But they wouldn't do it because God was telling them to speak. And so instead of being quiet, they prayed for courage to face up to the persecution. They prayed that God would help them speak the word of God boldly when they knew speaking that was going to get them into trouble. That took courage. And they prayed for more of it. In the United States, we really don't know what persecution is. You know? I mean, around here, if we're persecuted, that means somebody calls us intolerant or something. You know, we, we've, they use different phrases, and that's about it. You know? Or David and Chrissy had a little bit this summer. Um, it, it, uh, we mentioned before, David and Chrissy do videos uh, for Wednesday night and Thursday night for the kids to teach the main lesson because <clears throat> the kids won't listen to us when we just stand up here. So they put it on the TV, do a bunch of actions with it, and the kids pay a lot better attention. And one of the things that they did, they were trying to show what people think of Jesus. So last summer, David put on kind of a sandwich board thing that said, basically, um, I'll give you $2 if you tell me what you think of Jesus. And then David went over to the fairgrounds with Chrissy coming behind and filming. And they just went up to random people at the fairgrounds and said, tell me what you think of Jesus. I'll give you two bucks. And they got some interesting answers. Then in the blooper reel that they showed this Thursday, they also met some opposition. Uh, One of the folks in the animal barn came up. You can't do that here. Stop that. This is a public place. You can't be talking about religion here. You've got to shut that off. And, and I like David's response. He just said, oh, um, are you in charge here? Oh, no. Well, let's find out who is, you know, and we'll find out, you know. And they tracked down the person in charge. The person in charge, I don't care. <laughs> Go ahead. And then they showed that to the kids and used it as a teachable moment and told them, when you tell about Jesus... Sometimes people will want you to shut up. But all you need to do, you need to listen to them, you need to be polite, and then you need to keep doing you know, what you're doing, keep telling about Jesus. For us, that is persecution, and I'm sure that wasn't any fun for David and Chrissy to have that guy get in their face and tell them, shut that off! That's persecution for us. Compared to our brothers and sisters around the world, Christian brothers and sisters, that's mild. Because they are facing death. They are facing torture. Um, Economic loss on a scale we can't imagine. And that's more what Peter and John were facing as well. They were facing possible imprisonment, possible execution. And yet their prayer was not, Lord, protect us. Their prayer was, Lord, give us courage to continue to speak. And then they also prayed, Lord, help us to perform the signs and wonders so that people can see, can see you. 
And that just jumped out at me for some reason while I was reading this this time. That they prayed that they would be able to perform the miraculous signs and wonders. And it wasn't just for their own sake. I mean, quite often when we pray for someone to be healed, you know, a miraculous healing, it's because we want our friend to be healed. That's a good reason. That's not the only reason, and that's not really the reason they were doing it here. And it wasn't just so that they could be known as great miracle workers. They were saying, Lord, help us to continue to perform miracles in your name so that people will pay attention, basically. So that people will hear what you're doing. Because they had just healed this guy. And remember, hundreds if not thousands became Christians because of that testimony. So they knew that worked for some people. And so they were saying, Lord, give us the courage to keep uh, preaching boldly. And give us the ability to continue to do these miracles in your name. And that just jumped out at me. Um, In the Free Methodist Church, at least in the circles I travel in, um, we don't emphasize the signs and and wonders part of the ministry a whole lot. You know, we're more into holy living type thing. Um, We believe in the signs and the wonders. We know God can do them, and every once in a while we see him do it, you know, but we don't talk about it a whole lot, and we definitely don't try it. A whole lot. And I, this next part of the sermon is just kind of God speaking to me, I think, a little bit and rambling on my part, but I wonder if we're kind of leaving something on the table that God has given us to use. I wonder if we're leaving one of the tools that He has given us, just leaving it in the toolbox. And it makes a world of difference if you have the right tool for the job. You know, there's a lot of jobs that you can do with the wrong tools, but they t- it takes a lot longer, it's a lot more frustrating, and you get a lot more bloody knuckles, you know? I mean, if you've ever tried changing the oil when you don't have the right tools, you know, that, that's a relatively simple thing on a, on a car, right? At least it used to be. I haven't been under one in quite a while. But, um, you know, it used to be you'd, you'd run up, the front wheel's up on the ramp or something, you know, or if you didn't have the ramps, if you had a ditch out in front of your house and you could straddle that, you know, then crawl under there and, you know, be about this far from the underneath of the car and get to working down there and you can change the oil. Oh, yeah. I have also worked in a, in a mechanic shop where you pull the car in and you put it on a hoist and go... And then you work up here. It is so much easier when you have the right tools, when you have the right equipment. And I do wonder if God has given us these tools and we've kind of said, no, it's okay, we'll just leave them over there. And I wonder if part of the reason is because we're afraid to use them. You know, some tools are kind of powerful. And some will get you if you use them wrong. I mean, it... If you're not very familiar with using a chainsaw, chainsaws are fun. They are also dangerous. You know? They jump back at you or something, bad things can happen fast. And so some people just say, nope, not going to use it. You know, and others of us kind of use them like this, which isn't the best way to do it either. But I wonder if it's our fear of failure that sometimes keeps us from trying. Because nobody likes to fail. You know, and we certainly don't want to fail where other people can see us do it. So I wonder if we just kind of say, well, no, I'm not going to pray that way. I'm not going to take a stand. I'm not going to speak up. Because what if it doesn't happen? We'll look stupid then. But are we willing to try our part? To do our part? You know? Um, last week, again, we were, we were talking about this passage And we mentioned when Peter and John first saw the guy that they looked intently at the man. And I asked why they did that. And we talked about they wanted wanted the man to know that God saw him where he was. And that may well be part of it. There was also another theory that I planned to share last week, and I forgot. Um, For those of you in my Sunday school class, we shared it down there. And I'm sorry, but you're about to hear a rerun. Um, But... 
It is also possible, I believe, that with the Spirit's help, they were not so much looking at the man as they were looking in the man, seeing if he had the faith to be healed, if he had the faith to do his part. Because he had to, he had to help in this healing process. God provided the power. Peter and John provided the conduit. But the man had to do his part. They could pull him to his feet, but he had to stand. He had to believe he could do that. Because just getting up isn't enough. When, when I was just a kid, um, Grandpa and Grandma had a speedboat, and we'd water ski behind it. We had a lot of fun. Um, they would now tell you, it, I think it was a 45-horse Sea King motor. They'd probably now tell you that that's not big enough to water ski behind, but we didn't know that, so we had lots of fun, you know? And I remember trying to, trying to learn how to do it. I was just small, and they, they put you in the life jacket, and you kind of lean back in the water, laying down in the water, almost like you were in a recliner, you know? And the life jacket's holding your head up above water, and I'm fighting to keep the tips of the skis just above and pointed in the right direction. And the boat starts to pull out, you know, and you're hanging on to the rope, and the slack gets smaller and smaller. And when it, almost as tight, then the guy helping you would yell, Hit it! And the boat would take off. And by the time all the slack was up, the boat was going pretty well, and it'd give you quite a jerk, you know? And with 45-horse motor for the adults, they kind of had to work at it, kind of ride it out a little bit until the boat would pull them up and they could plane on the water like that. I was not an adult. I was a little kid. That rope went taut, and I just poop right up out of the water, man. I'm up, and yeah, this is great. But I didn't think it through. At least the first time I came up, and right over. Because it's not enough to just get up. Because the boat keeps pulling you. You know, and, and I learned pretty quickly that you kind of have to, you know, lock your legs in and lean back a little bit, that sort of thing. You have to brace yourself against the pull of the boat so you can stay on your feet. Otherwise, it's up and over. On the bright side, when you fall water skiing, it doesn't hurt near as much as snow skiing because you're falling into water. It, it feels a lot better. I've tried both. It, water skiing is a lot less painful. Um, but when Peter and John helped this guy up, even if they had both grabbed on and just yanked him up, if the guy would have went, oh, no, I can't stand, I can't stand, he would have been up and right on down. He had to do his part. He had to lock his legs. He had to stand. He had to say, I can walk. He had to believe. He had to do his part. You know, we want to see God do great things in our church. We want to see God do great things in our families. But are we willing to do our part? Will we dare to do our part? It may be as simple as, you know, starting out with the baby steps. I mentioned last week when that guy was healed, he went from being crippled for 40-plus years to jumping and running in a minute or two. That is not the way it normally happens. Normally, walking is a learned process, and it takes a lot of ups and downs and all that sort of process. And maybe we just need to start out with some baby steps when it comes to praying with courage. You know, maybe it's just as simple as we've talked about before when we hear that someone is hurting and we feel God starting to lead us to, to help them instead of just praying or saying, you know, oh, that's a bummer, I'm sorry you're hurting, or even just saying, you know, that's a bummer, I'll be praying for you. Instead, if we say, can I pray with you? Let them hear us pray. Let them know that they are being lifted up to God. And also, what do we pray then? You know? Are our prayers clear enough that anyone can tell if they're answered or not? 
You ever think about that? Sometimes we make the mistake of making our prayers about as clear as a politician's campaign promises. Well, if you elect me, I will clean up Washington. What does that mean? Absolutely nothing. How can you measure that? Four, we uh, four years later. It seems like four weeks in that's another election, doesn't it? Four years later, they're going, I'm ready to be elected. Did you clean up Washington? I don't know. How can you tell? We, we don't know. Did they live up to it? We don't know. Was the prayer answered? We don't know because the prayer was so vague, nobody knows. We didn't pray anything. And we do have to be careful here. We do have to be careful. Obviously, it is not always God's will to heal. And we certainly cannot be presumptuous enough to try to tell God what to do because we want it that way. But when the Spirit is leading us, when we feel the Spirit guiding us, and we just feel that nudge that it is okay to pray specifically for this situation, specifically for this healing, specifically for this to happen, will we dare to do it? So that the person, when that happens, will be able to know that God answered that prayer. Are we going to pray that God will work the signs and wonders through us? Now, obviously, I'm not talking about going off the deep end. I'm, I'm not saying that we'll start advertising our church as healings are us or something, you know. Yeah. Drive up through the carport there, and we'll have a window there. You put in your 20 bucks, and we'll give you a hanky that has guaranteed Christian sweat on it. Yes, you just put this Christian sweat on you, and you will be healed. Yes, it doesn't work that way. God doesn't work that way. But when we feel God speaking to our hearts, when we look at that person that is hurting and we want so much to pray God's resources into their lives and we feel God's spirit going, yeah, do it. Will we dare to do that? Peter and John saw a man that was crippled, that was hurting, that needed help. And with the spirit's vision, they knew he was, it was all right for them to say this. And they said, we want to heal you. And they did. And when they got in trouble for doing that, they prayed for courage so that they could do it all the more. They wanted to speak the name of Jesus boldly. They wanted to work signs and wonders in his name so that more people would come to Christ. Are we willing to pray that? That God will work through us? Let's stand together for prayer. Dear Lord, I do thank you. I do thank you for the way that you do work through us. And Lord, we know that we're not Peter and John. We know our failings, we know our shortcomings. And we know that we are messed up people. But Lord, we also know that you work through messed up people when we're willing to surrender our lives to you. So Lord, I pray that you will, as you did Peter and John, that you will give us courage so that we can speak the word of God boldly. And Lord, I pray that you will help us, if it be your will, to, to help us to do the signs and wonders, not to give us glory or anything of the sort, but to point people to you so that they will want to meet the one who gave the healing. We ask this in your name. Amen.
I send you off with a benediction found in 2 Peter verse, chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.